On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar titled Positive Outcomes to Patient Safety by Applying Lean Fundamentals in Healthcare. My name is Susan Wallace and I'll be your moderator for this program. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar. Michael Hogan is a Lean Master and Lean Design Specialist for the Business Improvement Group with 27 years of experience in operations management and continuous improvement projects. His extensive manufacturing experience has given him insights into applying lean principles in the healthcare setting, such as emergency departments, surgery, sterile processing, inpatient units, nutritional services, and laboratories. Michael has implemented lean, one-piece flow thinking in processes leading to improved efficiency and safety for patients, families, and staff. Wendy Fitz is the Director of Quality at Penn Medicine Lancaster General Hospital, a comprehensive not-for-profit health system located in the city of Lancaster and a member of the not-for-profit academic Penn Medicine Network. Her clinical expertise was gained through 24 years of service in the emergency department and trauma services at Lancaster General Hospital. And she has been a leader in the quality department for the past 14 years. During that time, Wendy was an active participant in the effort to incorporate lean as the daily management system throughout Lancaster General Health, developing a system of tiered huddles led by over 600 leaders at nearly 325 huddle boards serving 8,000 employees. Michael, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Susan. Hi, this is Michael Hogan. These are our objectives for today and what Wendy and I will be covering. Um, current state of healthcare safety, healthcare strategies with lean, um, lean safety in healthcare, and how lean management system helps promote safety. So every patient that arrives at your ED is wondering, or not ED, but hospital is wondering what is gonna happen to me as I progress through the steps of my care. And this was a little write-up I found a couple of years ago from a friend of mine, and it captured what the patient really thinks as they're going through the process. And I kind of live by this as we're applying lean in all the projects that we do as a group and how we take care of patients. There's high anxiety and they're very anxious as they go through the process. In today's environment, there's global healthcare spending um, that is also gonna rise between 2018 and 2022. And higher spending to us does not necessarily mean a guarantee of improvement. There's more and more shortage of healthcare workers in every area we go to. So the way that we're gonna combat this and we have to combat it is by making processes better, by removing the waste from those processes, thereby making them safer. Healthcare stakeholders and government payers and consumers and other organizations are always struggling to manage uh, the clinical operations and finances and I found this quote to be really kind of telling with the bold there, may help to solve today's problems. They don't even know if it's gonna to help to solve today's problems. So what we need to do is change that to a new care delivery model that focuses on safety, baseline the current process, and redefine how we deliver care, and really look at defining value added and safe practices, and that those are incorporated into the digital technology that we're using when and where we use it. This will ensure safe and efficient operations are followed all the time. So from a patient-focused standpoint, from a lean perspective, every project we do, every analysis that we do in healthcare is focused on the patient. And not only that, we also accomplish this by learning and teaching people in those hospitals and healthcare settings to identify waste and eliminate the waste from a root cause basis. So if we can remove the waste, I make the staff more efficient, which therefore gets them in front of the patient and gets the patient more comfortable. So those are things that, that we need to do from a project specific standpoint uh, in a lean world. In your world, if you have any of the symptoms in the circles on the left, um, you have a problem. So large batches, patients waiting, specimens batched up in laboratories, food that is either not hot or cold, and we've seen this in many times, mislabeled specimens, things that get mixed, and I'll show an example of that coming up. 
And how many of you have policies and procedures, many of them stacked up? Standard practices in many cases we find are outdated or change frequently, and they change due to lack of root cause analysis to fix things once and for all. So firefighting becomes the way of life. Leadership is not the person, it's technically the system that people are working in. And so many of them innovate and build their own workarounds in order to make things work. So we need to fix the system and we have to do that at a system level. Healthcare definitely needs to lower their costs and they need to do it through lean strategy and initiatives. But it's not just a one-time project. It's not just a project that happened last week and we did that project and it's gonna sustain forever. So we have to get this into the DNA of the system. We have to get it into everybody's mindset from the top to the bottom and the bottom back up to the top. And we need to really, in my opinion, revise, revive and revitalize that staff because they do have the answers and they will help make things very successful. But leadership has to drive it. Leadership has to drive the standard work model. Leadership has to live the standard work every day and create those metrics that drive improvement. So through identi identifying the need for improvement, training and educating people on lean, solid lean principles, and then identifying current value streams is extremely important. And I'll show an example of that coming up. And then have a strategy to deploy your lean initiatives. Lean deployment helps all areas, patient safety and satisfaction first and foremost. Not only that, but as we remove waste from the process, we improve quality overall for any process in the healthcare system. Anywhere we can get the staff involved in that improvement creates a model for sustaining that as we move forward. So we really need to turn this into a strategy for action um, throughout using lean initiatives. When we apply this, we have seen many, many examples of success in lean through emergency departments with reduced length of stay, left without being seen, and more importantly, errors. Surgical suites, reduced changeover, times, errors, sterile processing, which I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, and nutritional services, getting the patient better quality, better quality food, better quality delivery, um, and that's what they're looking for. Um, in one clinic, I'll give you a quick example. We saw a, a medical assistant do a 53 second turnover of, a, of an exam room. Well, that is not safe because she did not clean the room properly and put the Virex on the bed as much as she should have. It should have been at least three to four minutes. And so we see that over and over and over in the projects that we do, that shortcuts are being taken. And this all has high impact to patient safety. And through lean, you can remedy that. One of the problems that, that we've seen is that in many companies, people just put a toe in the water on Lean or Six Sigma. And even some cut their Six Sigma or Lean resources in the two bullets in the center of the page from 15 Six Sigma black belts down to two, from 40 Lean practitioners down to 10. And then they wonder why things aren't improving. Everybody, not only the Lean Six Sigma practitioners, but everybody in your leadership role needs to be trained in Lean and Six Sigma and the tools that they can use to improve these processes to ultimately help the patient. And, and the 20% of healthcare is only, that they say is only uh, successful, in my opinion, that's high. So we need to do more um, with lean and lean tools with leadership um, to get this to sustain on an ongoing basis. So it only works if you have unwavering support at every level. And as a key driver in your strategies and systems, lean should be a key subject matter at all staff meetings at the executive level and throughout the company. You have to live this. You can't just use it as a project once in a while. And create a culture of positive accountability. What that means is we hold people accountable, but we do that by coaching and mentoring them and teaching them how to do effective root cause analysis. Um, there's tools that, are, you know, don't look at the tools as only a floor initiative. Um, and have a constant recognition and celebrate what you're doing and then provide a continuous education and training platform. Time and time again, we see that once as an external consultant, we leave, they don't continue to train people or new people. Healthcare has shortages. That means they're bringing in new people all the time. Train them in lean, train them in the tools 
train them in the systems that you've done in the standard work. It's the only way it's going to sustain, and it's the only way that you're going to create a safe environment for the patient. So one of the things that we use is the basic model. And the basic model is very simple. It's a logical progression of tools, and it, is, it has a focus pattern to it as we implement projects throughout healthcare. It does require a discipline, disciplined approach and requires having some people in your organization learn the whole process. And it's very repeatable once they learn it and they can apply it to all areas um, of healthcare. An example of a test that was uh, ordered um, could be an error defect. The result of this was that the patient had to stay at the clinic for four hours waiting for the result. The wrong test was almost given, and the whole reason was the circle down below with the letters B and S there. And what we found out after four hours was those were nearly the MD and the RN's initials, and they were going to order a blood sugar test. Maybe a small problem, maybe just a small little thing, but how often does this happen on forms and paperwork that goes throughout healthcare? And we see it all the time in all the areas we go. So many of you on the line have probably been exposed to waste or heard the lean waste. Well, waste blinds us to everything. It raises our cost, provides no corresponding value, and causes defects in our work. For me, more importantly, waste creates blinders and we get used to it every single day and we accept it. And in my opinion, in healthcare, we should no longer accept it. Um, as a patient myself, um, I'm always wary of what's going on around me and what's happening with the system and all those wastes that take place. Everywhere you look, these eight ways apply in healthcare. Excessive blood draws, excessive staff idle time, not getting to the patient, and all of you on the line can tell me about transportation of either a patient or your staff who's going back and forth too many times to too many different areas. Intubated children who are making too many turns to go to a radiological suite or a surgical suite. Um, inventory, excess inventory, or the wrong inventory, obsolete inventory, leads to unsafe practices. And, and waste of defective product are, are just some of the things that we've seen over time. So we use tools, and these are just some of the tools that we use when we go and employ lean uh, in healthcare, uh, value stream maps, patient product flow, staff analysis. We actually break down the patient and then or the product from what the staff, nursing, techs, uh, pharmacists, what they're doing, and analyze every step of what they're doing so we understand and remove the waste and get them to the value-added steps that they need, and then overlay that with great standard work that they actually write and implement, and then follow that up with a system of audit and sustaining through leadership that is solid and they can repeat over and over. So there's other things like 5S total productive maintenance for your biomed equipment that is constantly, in my opinion, uh, I was just in an ED last week, constantly machines they need to go use are down and broken. They're not on any program and they should be in, in, in the healthcare. As a live example, in August of 2016, I was asked to talk, go up and talk to a CNO, CO of a large health system. And her comment to me was, you be, would you be willing to help us fix our sale processing area before we seriously hurt one of our patients? And so initially I thought, how really bad could it be? Well, lo and behold, every item you see on the right side of that screen was found in a surgical tray. Over so many different days, those, the Sharpie, the chapstick, and the pen were found in a tray. The pen was an SPD supervisor's pen, and it was found in a case in a tray where a child was already anesthetized and it was the daughter of one of the systems provider. And so how really bad can it get? Very unsafe uh, situation, have to stop surgery and you know, take care of the child. So what do we do? First thing we do is we baseline, create the vision, meet with the stakeholders, develop our boundaries, and then we train a core team. And we highly train them in lean principles and tools, collect data and analyze, build complete value stream maps, brainstorm for improvements. And then there's other steps that we do throughout the basic model from analyzing, suggesting solutions, uh, implementing, and checking our work. 
So in a data analysis, we use heavy data analysis. We find that 75% of statistic or sterile processing operations require manual sorting and handling by staff. Heavy, heavy, heavy uh, human intervention. 5,000 instruments per day, more in some cases, a million and a half a year of repetitive, repetitive work. And why do mistakes happen? Why do those things end up in a tray or why do the wrong instruments end up in a tray? So when we value stream map the process, we start to see things that pop out to us as areas for improvement. It helps us identify waste and the potential unsafe practices. We will take this map and then take it to the next iteration where we will actually implement Kaizen bursting on the map and areas for improvement. In this particular project, this fishbone diagram is only a diagram of the decontamination process. It is not even the whole SPD. We had four of these around a 220 square foot room. And what do you think leadership said when they walked in and saw that? They had no idea how bad things can really get. And this is directly affects patient safety. So some of the errors that we found, no job rotation, numerous, numerous distractions when people are trying to sort materials and instrumentation, lack of standard work, um, very much lack of SOPs in the system. So we can't just look at the SPD, we have to look at the whole process. So what we found from an AORN standard was that we were not meeting the OR back table, the decontamination process was not good, the washers met minimum standards, the assemblies were not meeting any of the AORN standards, the sterilization was minimal, was haphazard, and the OR setup was not meeting expectations. Um, all those are system problems. We attack that system, we start to look at things like where can we put effective SOPs? Where can we put effective standard work? Identify and call out safety violations. Address distractions. Do 5S in the area. And then adhere to any guidelines from a healthcare regulatory standpoint. We have to do that. So when you're addressing patient safety, it's always important to use data to drive informed decisions. And once we started using the data to drive improvement, we started to zero in on our top problems, and they were the ortho and neuro. And those are really critical cases, and so especially the neuro, and I don't mean to undermine any surgery, but it's so important to have what you need, when you need it, in the right order, um, in healthcare, every single time. And I could add, I could show you many, many more examples um, of different areas. I just happened to select sterile processing. So what happened? Defect rates in, in 2015 were getting close to 14% defects on trays. Uh, effective by 2017, they were down to 3%, just a little over, with a target of 2%. And quite frankly, our, our target for the project is zero defect. Lean works on a zero defect basis. Six Sigma says 3.4 defects per million, but healthcare, that's not allowable in my, my opinion. You have to go to zero defect in order to make quality and safety be number one for the patient, so critical uh, for all the patients. So it is achievable. We wanna work with individuals to discover processes that always put the patient in safety first, first and foremost. Work with the organization. We help train organizations and leaders and build a culture of improvement and a culture of training and how they can get this into their staff on an ongoing basis and then really empower multidisciplinary teams to collaboratively create new processes to improve care. And then work around the world, and we've done this, to share this with everybody on how we're improving the patient safety experience. And the quote by Elizabeth Dunphy there from Virginia Mason is one of the best quotes. Um, we can't make healthcare perfect until we make every single process perfect. So, every level of detail, every syringe, every bowl, every basin, anything you touch, we need to do it correctly. And we need to do it correctly the first time and every time, in our opinion. And that's what we emphasize when we do um, lean projects. And every single one of our lean projects in healthcare has high impact on patient safety. So my recommendation 
is that you create a burning platform and you have to have that compelling need to change. And dedicate the right resources. Part-time resources only delay implementation. Select the right place to begin. Success breeds more success. And I should have put this as number one, but train, teach, and mentor over and over and over. Things change. Lean changes. Six Sigma changes. And so you have to stay on top of this stuff. And it has to, in my opinion, has to become part of the organization's DNA if you really want lean to work and reap the benefits of removing waste and creating a safe environment for the patient and the staff and their families. So establish ownership, create that positive accountability culture, and that's that really good key performance indicators. Select measures to succeed and monitor them. The measures you select, people will perform to them. So make sure you're selecting the right metrics that you're using and then govern the program at a very high level from steering committee, executive committee, and then do that every single day. And then don't forget to always celebrate. So I'm gonna turn this over to Wendy and she's gonna take over. Thanks, Mike. That was a phenomenal, concise overview of lean methodology in healthcare and in particularly as the solid performance improvement methodology that it is. Lancaster General uh, has adopted lean both as a performance improvement methodology, but also as our journey to become a highly reliable organization. And I'm gonna beg forgiveness right off the bat. There are two acronyms that I do tend to use in my everyday life, and so I'm gonna define them right off the beginning. The very first one is LMS. LMS stands for Lean as a Management System. And we believe that every employee every day has the responsibility and the accountability to utilize continuous improvement and performance improvement in their job every day. And LMS allows us to do that, and I'll talk more about that. The second one that I tend to use is called Highly Reliable Organizations, or HROs. And so what I decided to do today was go to the last page of the book first and tell you that our journey and our implementation of Lean as a Daily Management System is part of our journey to get to be a highly reliable organization. And a very quick definition around that, I love this IHI circle because it incorporates the learning system the culture, and leadership. A highly reliable organization operates in a really complex, high-hazard domain. That sounds like healthcare, right? For extended periods of time without serious accident or catastrophic failures. Potential problems are anticipated, detected early, and responded to in the event to try and prevent that catastrophic consequence. And so you're gonna hear a little bit about our attempt and our journey to target zero harm through work to attain high reliability. And our use with Lane as a management system is, was step one for us. So the very first day that all employees at Lancaster General, and we're nearing uh, approximately 10,000 at this point, day one, orientation, they hear from a senior leader that they have accountability for wearing two hats. The first is to do your job and do your job well. And the second one, which is uh, just as important and should take up just as much of your energy, time, and effort, is to try and improve the process for your job every day. And we use the words pretty simply, just try and make it easier for yourself. <laughs> because we know in that they are there to provide excellent care to patients or to provide excellent care to customers. If they are trying to do that job and do that job well by looking for improvements in their work every day, it will end up with a quality product. And just as importantly for our leaders, they also have two hats, not just to lead their team and develop their improvement, their people, but to try and drive improvement every day. And so the very first day they're hearing that from a senior leader, before they leave the end of that orientation, they're gonna get a 45 minute um, basic look at lean. They're gonna uh, be introduced to a performance improvement coach. And then at day 120 
of their employment with us, we bring them back out of the healthcare setting, back to a classroom setting, and they have a, a four-hour lean basic fundamentals class where they learn some of the lean tools, uh, particularly around standard work. And so I want to infuse some of the principles of a high, highly reliable organization and tell you how it connects to LMS. So number one is deference to expertise. So people in high, highly reliable organizations appreciate that the people closest to the work are the most knowledgeable about the work. And we truly believe that, and that's why we introduce every single employee, minute one, to their senior leader, and they learn about Lean as a management system. And our journey, although we have been using Lean as a PI methodology since 2010, our journey for using it as our operating system really began in 2016. We identified 600 leaders in that first cohort that um, we established would need leadership training. So it's a six-day leadership training. Three of those days are really working on utilizing lean tools, and then the second three days is learning how to use those tools within your operating system and with your staff to try and drive improvement every day. In that first year, those 600 leaders were trained at that six days. We established about 350 active huddle boards, and in that first year, there were 12,000 ideas generated from our staff. We also, in that very first year, took that really important step of moving from, if you worked in healthcare long enough, there are a million goals that people throw at us. Typically, we had anywhere from 10 to 15 goals as a leader. We went to establish five domains of focus and five goals so we all could work together at driving improvement around those five domains of focus, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Then in 2017, after we sort of had that first cohort of 600 people through, and we still continue to train leaders every month, and we've had almost uh, 1,200 leaders trained at this point because we went down another level into the frontline manager, supervisor, clinical supervisor level, and so we're continuing to train leaders all the time. But in 2017, our focus really became, okay, how do we now focus all of this energy around continuous improvement, problem solving, and problem identification? How do we really now begin to drive that vehicle forward to focus on some of our bigger problems? Because once you start huddling and people start to give you ideas, the sort of low-hanging fruit is easily addressed, and you begin to get into more complex problems. And so we introduced at that point um, A3 problem solving, which is just a problem solving methodology based on Plan Do Check or Plan Do uh, Plan Do Check Act. And we continued with the huddle boards, and we still have about 350 huddle boards active. And in the current year that we're working right now. We're really trying to make sure that leaders are in the place where the work takes place, not just to see how the work is going on, but to make sure that standard work is actually being implemented and audited. And we believe that in healthcare, standard work is one of our probably biggest gaps and biggest areas that we need to address, and Mike certainly uh, talked about that as well. I'm going to now talk about the second principle around HROs, and that's reluctance to simplify. So people in high reliability organizations understand that the work is complex and dynamic and moving. They seek underlying rather than surface explanations. And so it would be easy to just say, well, we have a problem with catheter-associated UTIs in our organization, and tell the people to, well, follow the standard work and try and do better. But you can't accept that at face value. You really have to be willing to meet the people where they are, be in the gemba or the place where the work takes place with them to really solve the problem down to the deepest root cause. And so we began to do a three waves, which I'm also going to talk about. 
So I'm going to step back a second and talk about how do you get to goal setting that would seem limiting, but it's really not. We pick the most important things to us, and that is, first of all, our people. We want to make sure that we have the best staff and we want to retain and reduce turnover. We want to make sure that we provide quality care. And so we selected reducing 30-day readmission rates as that um, metric that we could all begin to work on. And when I say all of us, I'm including all of our primary and specialty care practices, all of our ambulatory sites, as well as the uh, inpatient hospitals that we own. Second one is experience. We certainly always want to make sure that our patients are happy and our customers are happy. And so we worked on likelihood to recommend. Access, I will tell you, and we're going to talk a little bit about our emergency department, is very busy. We see nearly 120,000 patients a year in an ED that was not built for nearly that many. And so we really wanted to work on reducing the number of patients who left without being seen under the larger umbrella of increasing the number of managed lives within our community and um, the managed lives within our accountable care organization. And then, of course, finance. You need to make sure that you're strong financially, and we worked on maintaining uh, operating margin at budget. And that really takes us to the next HRO principle, which is sensitivity to operations. People in HROs strive to maintain a high awareness of operational conditions or big picture understanding. And this was a critical step for us. Our CEO was in the very first training all day, every day, and the minute that she came out of training, she established huddling with her senior leadership team. She brought all 800 leaders together and said, I expect you to utilize this system. I want to lead by example. I've already begun, but I'm expecting that every leader will engage with their staff every day about driving improvement within our healthcare system. And so Mike talked about the encouragement that is, uh, and the commitment that is required by senior leadership to make this successful, and I cannot emphasize that enough. And so she's setting the stage all in, everyone expected, then allowed us to all begin to focus on these same goals. And that's a challenge, as you can imagine, in a large, complex organization, and certainly one in which we're part of a larger organization of Penn Medicine. It can be very challenging, and so everyone is allowed and invited to the table to discuss the goals. We use a catch ball session to make sure that the goals established by senior leadership can be implemented at the bedside down to the staff level and ones that make sense to them. And so how did we do that? We're going to use our example of trying to decrease the number of patients who left without being seen. On our small graph there on the left-hand side, in fiscal year 16, although our rate of people who left without being seen was under benchmark at 1.77%, that accounted for 2,000, over 2,000 patients leaving our front door. We did not consider that acceptable. Our mission and vision is to provide excellent health care to the communities that we serve in this area, and we felt like we were not doing that. And so we thought, okay, let's use our new operating system that we just developed and see how we can utilize it. And this is going to sound and look very hospital-centric, but it was not. I can tell you that every leader and every employee could probably tell you how many patients left the ER every day without being seen because they were all invested in meeting this goal. So at the system level, if you follow the arrow, the system goal was to reduce left without being seen to less than 110 patients per month. At the chief nurse executive level, she took a goal of 30% of discharges per day will leave by noon. 
If you're in healthcare and you know anything about emergency departments, you know the importance of throughput. And so we know from our metrics that our emergency department is very efficient when they are processing patients. What happens is we can't get the admitted patients out of the emergency department up into the hospital fast enough for them to be able to maintain flow. And so the chief nurse didn't take left without being seen as her goal. She said, I'm gonna concentrate on making sure once a bed is open that we get those patients up out of the ED. And we're gonna make sure if you're able to be discharged today safely, and that is always key, that we're gonna try and get you out by noon. That was the goal, making sure that all consultants had signed off and that we had safely and adequately provided the discharge needs for that patient. At the nursing director level, they were also looking at their units that they were responsible for, making sure that their discharges were out by noon, if at all possible, and if not, we implemented a discharge lounge that at the time was not consistently being utilized or even being open. And so we had to um, improve our consistency around that. At the frontline manager level, they were asked, just identify two patients out of all the ones you have discharged today, those two that you feel can safely go home by noon. And that's where they began to concentrate their efforts. And while they're huddling, they're collecting the whys. Why didn't, why weren't we able to meet that goal? And also, trying to reduce the time from dispo to depart for admitted patients, meaning if the patient is in the ED ready to go, ready to be admitted, can we get them upstairs as safely and quickly as possible? And then at the huddle level, they, again, were looking at, did we get our two patients out by noon? And why not? And we realized that ambulance transportation was becoming quite a challenge. We made sure that the discharge lounge was open every day and that we had identified the day before discharge which patients we felt could go home and got to sign off by the consultant. And as you can see, in fiscal year 18, we had dramatic reduction to 811. In fiscal year 19, we uh, did climb a bit again in that left without being seen, but we had an additional environmental challenge in our area with um, one of the other hospitals in the city closing. This is just a sort of a snapshot of the structure of our huddle boards. So you see those five domains across the top, safety, quality, access, experience, finance, and people, but we don't determine what metrics should go up there. It's really up to that huddle board leader what are they working on under that safety and quality pillar around decreasing readmissions and under access trying to make sure that people do not leave our ED without being seen. But the metric had to be specific to them on their unit. And so it may be, did we get our two patients out by noon? So the top row is the symptom or what is the problem? The middle row is really the diagnosis. What's the analysis? So if we didn't get the people out by noon, why not? And then trying to collect those whys every day. And then finally, let's treat the patient. And that was where we asked for ideas from our staff on how to improve the whys or why we were not meeting that particular goal. And so that's just a snapshot of what our huddle boards look like across the system. And that brings us to HRO principle number four, a commitment to resiliency. People in HROs assume that the system is at risk for failure and they practice performing rapid assessment and response to challenging situations. And so we believed that the huddling system where leaders stand with their staff every day and on 24 seven organizational structure areas Many times a day, each shift, they were using Plan, Do, Check, Act and their huddle board to make problems visible. And we always use the analogy that if there weren't any problems identified, that that really was a problem, that we really weren't looking deep enough. And so as those ideas began to come forward, we saw some really complex issues that required teams of people that would cross over disciplines, 
areas, hospitals, inpatient and outpatient. And so we moved to A3 improvement teams and we use, we use a WAVE approach where we may bring in 10 different teams with two PI coaches who walk them through their problem, both using some classroom education as well as PI coaching at the elbow back in the Gemba where they're trying to solve their problem. And this are just an example of the more than 75 teams that have gone through our A3 waves. And what we found is when you teach the people, and again, critical for our success, when you teach the people how to solve their problems and how to use the methodology of Plan, Do, Check, Act, how do they infuse looking at lean and eliminating waste from a process every day, if you teach them how to do that themselves, and develop the competency within the leaders, they will then be able to solve their own problems. At the same time, we also implemented crew or crew resource management. Those of you who understand and know team steps know that this is uh, the same methodology. And so in our high risk areas, both our operating suites, our interventional radiology unit, labor and delivery, NICU, and radiology itself, where there was a high risk that there's a hierarchy where someone who may not feel comfortable to stand up and say, I'm sorry, I believe that we might have an error. That culture did not exist in some of our high-risk areas. And so we implemented CREW, trying to enable the staff and everyone at all levels to be able to stop the line, which is, again, a lean principle. And so, in ending, I want to show you that this is our emergency department. We implemented, they were one of the very first people to implement a several time a day huddle. This is our ER nurse manager. She rolls the huddle board, it's portable, right into the middle of the nurse's station. For seven to 10 minutes, they huddle during that shift about whatever problem metric she's working on. That leads to asking why, which generates ideas. and. She then has to make sure that she allows time and energy for her staff to take action to lead to solving those problems. Um, but we believe if you can do it in an emergency room as busy as ours, that you can do huddling and use lean as a management system anywhere. And that every employee every day looking and solving problems and utilizing their own brain power and ideas for change is really the best way to implement lean as a management system and to journey down toward the roads of high reliability. So I'll turn it back over to you, Susan. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, and thank you, Michael and Wendy, for some really great information. And this concludes the slide presentation portion of our program, uh, but we have plenty of time for you if you would like to be uh, ask any questions uh, during our question and answer period. So if you do have a question, please type them in the Q&A box, and that's found at the bottom of your screen. You just have to hover at the bottom of your screen, you'll see three dots, and then click the dots to open the Q&A panel, and that's where you can write in your question to all panelists, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. So we do already have a question here, and uh, Michael and Wendy, just feel free to you know, answer. And the first question from Brenna is, uh, what are your tips or tricks to revive and revitalize staff? To revive Again. and revitalize. Yeah, to revive and revitalize the staff. It's to uh, reinvigorate the training again, and, and to me, it has to be done from senior leadership. I was just in an organization where they're doing that, um, and they are rolling out some effective training programs on lean. They don't have to take a long time from a, just an awareness of what we're going to do and some of the methods. Um, when you get into specific departments, you can get more detailed, but always involve some of your staff members in core teams in training. They're the ones that make it happen day to day. So. Wendy, I'd, I'd love to hear your input. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. The people at the front line know the problems and they probably also know how to solve them. They really need some help with tools um, and time to be able to solve the problems. But I hear what the question's about is around revitalizing. And 
it can be very difficult standing in front of your team every day trying to lead a huddle when they may or may not be engaged. And we certainly do see that um, energy wax and wane throughout the year. One of the things that we've done is to um, identify some of those frontline people who might be a informal leader of the team. So not an assigned facilitator or charge nurse, but maybe somebody who you see as an informal leader. And we actually bring them into the six-day leadership training, teach them how to lead huddle. And then, although the leader must always attend, we allow that staff person to engage um, in additional leadership training and then leadership um, initiatives within their team. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know of any videos that show examples of how to run a huddle board? That was one of the questions. Well, there's some, I mean, if you, if you, yeah, if you go out on YouTube, you can find some uh, different huddles. I, I have like two or three of them um, on huddle boards out there. It's kind of tailored to the organization. Um, I would consider Wendy's to be more advanced than some I've seen. Um, high level of metric usage, um, that type of thing. Um, there's there's kind of many different ways to do it. I, I think first and foremost, running the huddle every day is very important and making sure that you don't miss any days. And then two, it's content. And so the content is important of what you're trying to accomplish by delivering uh, the message. So there are some things on YouTube. I don't know of any canned place that you can just go buy one, Wendy. Yeah, I, I agree. We we actually uh, just uh, videoed some of our own leaders um, leading huddle. And we also practice that in training. And then the PI coach will go to the um, huddle itself and help that leader practice as well. That's another good way. It's hard to watch a video and then sort of emulate that at leading a huddle. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think this question is more for Wendy and it's from Catherine who's asking, do you participate in the culture of safety survey? Yes, we do. Uh, yes, we do. Every, at least every year we do culture of safety. We had originally done some high-risk areas and one year and then the next year we would do the entire organization. But um, the last several years we've done the entire organization. And then we do a pulse check throughout the year in between those culture of safety surveys um, to see how we're doing as leaders. But we definitely use the results of that survey to help us um, enunciate what's a better way to sort of do this work. Not everybody um, just can attend a huddle and feel like we've really, you know, knocked out patient safety. It's much bigger than that. But we do use those results to help us mature the system. Mm -hmm. and, and Michael, do you uh, recommend using the culture of safety survey? Are you familiar with that? Yes, I am familiar with it. Yeah. Um, although as an external consultant, I don't I don't get involved with it that much at hospitals, but I highly recommend it. Um, it it's mm -hmm. so important to get this built into the organization from a safety standpoint. I, as an ex external consultant, I get to go behind the doors um, that the patients don't see, and and having that culture of safety and so forth um, in the foundation of your organization is really really important. Okay. All right, we have another question from Megan. How do you hold team members accountable for participating in huddles and improvement processes? Uh, I'll, I guess I'll start, Mike, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> sure. We do take attendance. We believe that's important, and I know that's really hard. I was the leader of a large emergency department, and I know it's hard to even keep 150 staff members straight. But here's what happens if you don't take attendance. It's very easy for one of your staff members to say, oh, I'll go do X while you all go to huddle. And what we found when we did a Gemba walk and we asked that person, what are your goals? They couldn't answer them because conveniently they had excused themselves from huddle every single day for months and the leader didn't realize it and uh, the next day she started uh, taking attendance. We do recommend that. 
Yeah, I would okay. agree. I would agree. I've initiated a number of hospitals doing huddles. And um, at first, when we did this years ago, uh, we made it optional. That just doesn't work. And um, usually what happens is the people that aren't going, it's a very low percentage, and, and they have some other issues. Um, they're using the huddle as kind of their leverage to not go and make a statement. So we'll have the director of the area or supervisor talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, and they end up going uh, to the huddle. So, yeah, I totally 100% agree with Wendy. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, for both of you, uh, does applying lean work better in a specific department? Um, for me, uh, for me, lean works in every department, and I've worked in just about every uh, healthcare department. Um, where you start lean is probably uh, the better question. So yes, the answer to the question, lean works in every department. Most people want to start in the ED because it's the front door, it's very visible. Um, you know, and we often go in and say, you should really start in the inpatient unit to create that pull from the ED, um, but they don't necessarily like to do that. So um, EDs are very visible. You can see a lot happening when you do a lean project, and you can definitely see improvement with patient throughput. Uh, so a lot of people will start in those areas. Some of the softer areas like administration or pre-admission testing, um, you know, some of those places don't get the visibility that an ED or an OR get. So the answer, direct answer is it applies everywhere, um, and usually people put it where their biggest problem is. Totally mm -hmm. agree. And um, I, I certainly have read many books and have seen organizations that have started sort of that model cell in one area. And Mike's right, they always want to pick the ER or the OR because those are where throughput can be seen and certainly have some of the biggest issues, but if you don't have a receiving area to get those patients up out of, you really might get frustrated by whatever gains you make. We took the approach that we knew that we wanted to do the entire organization. We started in a service line. So the very first class was cardiology, ICU, cath lab, so that that service line could begin to huddle and be able to elevate ideas or issues up and down the chain. But quickly and within three months, our CEO told everyone she wanted them to huddle and that we would get them trained as we could. And so we ramped up our training very quickly and really sort of went big bang over a year. Mm -hmm. Uh, how long does a lean pr event or project typically take? Uh, depends on what you're doing. So you can do a Kaizen event for five days or three days, I've seen them, or you can do a long event. I'm going to be doing an ED project. It's an 11-week project. So it depends on the, the boundaries and the scope as you define it. Typically ORs, emergency departments, some inpatient units, depending on the type, will take a little bit longer. Um, design projects can be shorter if it's just a pure design project. Uh, so it, it all depends on what you, your philosophy and the method you want to use. If it's pure Kaizen, it can be shorter, um, but we like to do lean because it's a system approach from the beginning of the value stream to the end. Mm -hmm. Totally agree, totally agree. We had originally done many, many Kaizen events, five-day events, and we found that we had some trouble with sustainability, and that's why we moved to Lean as an operating system where all leaders, all in, every day, with every staff member driving improvement. If it's complex, we can um, put them in an A3 wave, and that can take up to 12 weeks, but that's only because we're training them and then we're going to the GEMBA and helping them look at the problem. Then we bring them back to the class and then we go back to GEMBA with them. So it's intended to be elongated just so that we don't impact operations while we're trying to solve a complex problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, this webinar will be ending soon, but we do have time for maybe one or two more questions before the end of the program. Uh, we have a question. How much lean training is required? 
again, you know, it can vary for the core team doing a project, like an 11 week project, they have to go to a four day uh, intense immersion type training and lean in the tools, um, along with other key stakeholders that will touch the project. Um, if it's post the project and you want to train the remainder of the department, we recommend doing a one day lean awareness training uh, where they're getting to understand some of the terminology and words and then some of the tools that are going to be employed. They won't, they won't get into the whole core team immersion type thing, but there's different levels based on the project. Okay. Any thoughts, Wendy? Um, we do something similar. We, uh, like I said, we, we include all leaders and they are required to take the six day training but all employees on day one get an hour on lean and then at uh, day 120 of their employment, they come back for four hours for basic. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Uh, and Wendy, what was your biggest challenge? I think for us, our biggest challenge, we're a established or 125 year old organization and had a lot of established leaders who had been here for a long time, long tenure, and had been very successful in that tenure. <laughs> and so it was difficult for them to say, well, why should I change my management style? And when you use lean as a management system, you definitely are changing from a traditional model where you make all the decisions and you do the firefighting to one where you're empowering and enabling and working with your team to solve the problems at their level. And that was a challenge for us. Um, and those who were uh, very traditional managers, they struggled at first. But once they saw how quickly their staff picked this up and began to solve their own problems, we had some real converts. That's great. Okay, well, thank you again, uh, Michael and Wendy. This concludes our webinar.